Great. Well, welcome and happy Alaska Wild Salmon Day, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy summer schedules to join us here. And hopefully you're about to enjoy some wild salmon for lunch, or you have plans to share a salmon meal, to share a salmon meal with family and friends later today. Um, the song that I was playing when you signed in is called Spawn Till You Die by the one and only Ray Troll and the Ratfish Wranglers. And we'll get to hear more from Ray Troll a little bit later. But um, my name is Elizabeth Herendine, and I'm joining you from Klingit Ani, the traditional lands of the Klingit people, where I live and work in Juneau, Alaska for Salmon State. And Salmon State's an Alaska nonprofit organization that works from Southeast Alaska up through the Yukon to ensure that Alaska remains a place where wild salmon and the people who depend on the salmon thrive. You can learn more about us and our work at salmonstate.org. And I just wanted to do a quick thank you to our co-host Braided River. Um, they've provided all the back end support to help make this virtual event possible. And thanks all also to our many community partners um, for their support, especially Ava's Wild and Salmon Sisters for providing some of the raffle prizes that we'll be giving out later um, in the program. And our intention for this midday virtual gathering um, is not just to recognize all the ways that wild salmon benefit us and our lives and our economy um, and communities, but to also honor our relationship with wild salmon and through that relationship, our connection with each other and the ecosystems that sustain us. So to kick things off, we invite you to share in the chat. Um, just type in three words that come to mind when you think about wild salmon. Um, and I can start by sharing that my three words when I think about wild salmon are gift, life, and hope. Um, so with that, we're going to jump in. We've got a pretty packed 30 minutes of stories, art, music, and prizes ahead of us here. And we're first going to begin with a special Salmon Day welcome from Melanie Brown. Melanie is an Indigenous commercial fisherman in Bristol Bay and also a longtime wild salmon advocate. And after Melanie's Salmon Day welcome, we're gonna hear from award-winning photographer and author, Amy Gulick, um, who's gonna share some stories and photos from her newest book, The Salmon Way, An Alaska State of Mind. And you might recognize Amy from her previous book, Salmon in the Trees, Life in Alaska's Tongass Rainforest. And since it wouldn't be an Alaska salmon event without Ray Troll, um, we're thrilled to have Ray with us today. And, and he's gonna share his salmon story and some of his salmon inspired art um, towards the end. And lastly, we're going to end um, our 30 minutes with some fun salmon inspired raffle prizes for those who pre-registered for today's event. Um, so last thing before we get going, just quick housekeeping. Um, due to our limited time today, we're not gonna be able to take questions, um, but we encourage you to reach out to us directly should you have questions or topics you wanna discuss with us further after this event, and we'll provide um, ways that you can get in touch with Amy, Ray, and myself afterwards. So with that, we're gonna get this going and start with Melanie Brown's Salmon Day, welcome. To my happy wild salmon day, I am reaching out to you from Slingit on Me, the place known as Juno. And I would ask that all of you take a moment to acknowledge the land that you are on and who first peopled it. My name is Melanie Brown and I'm connected to salmon through my mother, Catherine Brown, who is from Bristol Bay. Every year I've taken a migration along with the salmon to the Naknik River and um, all of us who have a connection to salmon um, recognize the magic that they bring to our lives and Amy has asked each of us to come up with three words that uh, salmon invoke in us in our thoughts or in our feelings and um, when you think of your three words please put them in the, the chat. Um, there is going to be a, a word cloud that's created with, with the words that are contributed. The three words that I thought of are life, cycle, and pulse. And um, I wrote a salmon song with my music partner, Marcus Beckman. Together, we are Sunny Porch, and we would really like to uh, 
share that song with you today on Wild Salmon Day. Marcus. Bill, song for salmon. Salmon song. Guyana Dailuchi for being here. Happy Wild Salmon Day. Well, hi everyone. Um, wow, that was beautiful. Thank you, Melanie. And um, thank all of you for being here to celebrate Alaska Wild Salmon Day. Uh, I'm Amy Gulick, and I'd like to acknowledge the Snohomish and Coast Salish for stewarding their ancestral homelands where I live in Washington State's Salish Sea. And I'd also like to thank the salmon for bringing us all together today. So when you think of salmon, what three words come to mind? Please share them uh, with the chat. And I love seeing all the, the words that have already come in. So when I think of salmon, my three words, bold, strong, enduring. And when I think of the relationships that people in Alaska have with salmon, it's the same three words that come to mind, bold, strong, enduring. So what is your relationship with salmon? Well, this is a question that I spent several years asking Alaskans at their homes, boats, and fish camps. And you'll find their stories and photographs uh, in my book, The Salmon Way, and I'll highlight just a few today. I'm very grateful to all the Alaskans who opened their homes and hearts and have allowed me to share their stories uh, with all of you. So I will share my screen here and share some of these wonderful stories. So first, uh, where are there salmon in Alaska? Let's, let's orient ourselves uh, quickly. So this map, this documents close to 20,000 streams, rivers, and lakes shown here in blue where you can find salmon. And I'll point out a few places that I'll be talking about today. So Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska, its watershed is the size of Kentucky. Southeast Alaska is the size of West Virginia, and it contains major transboundary rivers, the Taku, Stikine, and the Eunuch that originate in Canada and flow into the United States through Alaska. And the Kuskokwim River, this drains into the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, which is the size of Louisiana. And the Yukon River is the third longest river in North America. It is also transboundary. So when I look at this map, what I see is a living landscape, a beating heart whose arteries of life are all of those blue waterways. What you can't see are the salmon pulsing through those waterways, bringing life to bears, birds, plants, people, and communities. Everywhere I went, Alaskans told me that salmon are their lifeblood. So Pacific salmon start their lives in fresh water. They head out to the ocean to mature. And if all goes well, they return to their freshwater birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation. And then they die. So in between the beginning and end of their lives, a lot can happen. And at the end of their lives, they pass something on to the next generation. Not unlike us. What do we pass on? Can salmon teach us something about ourselves? So in the native village of Napaimute, I duck inside the low doorway of a smokehouse. Shelly Leary is inside hanging salmon strips. And she tells me, 
I was taught to always be ready to have food for the winter. I feel poor when I don't have food put up. When the smokehouse is filled, I feel good because I know I have enough. It's mid-June and among the season's first salmon, we speak in lowered voices, respectful of this bounty before us. The aroma of smoked fish permeates my skin, clothing, and the pleasure center of my brain. I feel a great sense of comfort here and I'm not sure why. Never having to think much about where my food comes from or the possibility of its scarcity, how could I begin to understand Shelley's feeling of well-being that comes with her full smokehouse? So we're on the Kuskokwim River, 250 miles uh, upstream from the mouth. And Shelly tells me a story of when she was in Seattle for a few days. A friend from Alaska was with her and they walked around the big city. And she says, we wondered what all those people would do when something bad happened. What would all of those people eat? We were glad we were going home soon. This is home for Shelly. So that's the difference between my and Shelly's comfort derived from her full smokehouse. Mine is immediate gratification, delicious food right now. Hers is long-term security, food for the winter, like money in the bank. I live under the delusion that there will always be food, even though I'm not growing, fishing, hunting, or storing it. Shelly lives under no such pretense. Who is the wiser? Who is rich? And what is wealth? So Shelly's Ingalik, an Alaska native and she and her family are among the 18% of Alaskans considered subsistence users of Alaska's fish and wildlife. Now for thousands of years, Alaska natives have fished, hunted and gathered as a way of life. Today, approximately 130,000 rural residents still rely on fish and wildlife, harvesting on average close to 300 pounds per person a year. And fish account for more than half of this amount. There's no other place in the United States wild and abundant enough that a significant number of people can still live this way. So today's concept of subsistence in Alaska, it's often misunderstood. The word itself implies a meager existence, but Alaskans who live this way of life all told me that they consider themselves rich people and they fight hard to maintain the right to continue their customary and traditional ways. Now, an outsider like me could see this as a food security issue, but I've come to learn that it's much more than that. It's about people whose identities, cultures, and connections to the land, waters, their ancestors, elders, children, and each other revolve around fishing, hunting, gathering, sharing, and respecting food and where it comes from, and teaching the next generations to do the same. Salmon bring people together. Three generations of this family gather at their fish camp on the Kuskokwim River. So let's meet another family from Juneau in Southeast Alaska, whose three generations gather because of salmon. Heather Hardcastle, she's standing in the middle wearing the yellow suspenders. And she tells me that her fondest childhood memory is riding in a skiff in the long twilight of an Alaska summer evening. With salt spray and the smell of spruce trees in the air, the boat whisked her to see spawning salmon near the transboundary Taku River. Heather's parents, Pete and Sheila, they're on the left. They fished the Taku River and they sold salmon commercially in the summers. And they brought young Heather, her brother, and the family dog along on their boat, named the Heather Ann. Heather says she grew up eating salmon every day in every way. And it wasn't until she left Alaska to attend college in North Carolina that she appreciated the abundance of salmon that still exists in her home state and the way of life it allows commercial fishermen to live. Heather's husband, Kirk, is sitting in front of her with their daughter, Kiyoe. Kirk grew up in a culture in Northern California that revolves around high quality locally produced food. So when he began to fish commercially with Heather's dad, he saw the potential to bring superb fish directly to restaurants, markets, and consumers. So together with two friends, Renee and Winston on the right with their daughter, Athena, they formed Taku River Reds. This is a company that prides itself on honoring both the fish and the fishermen by providing high quality wild Alaska salmon and supporting a way of life for fishing families. Heather advises an international coalition called Salmon Beyond Borders that works to conserve the transboundary salmon rivers that straddle the United States-Canada border. And she says, these rivers are our lifeblood. My dad has always said to evaluate any proposed activity or development through the lens of salmon. Whatever's good for salmon is going to be good for the environment, community, and economy. Grateful for the life that salmon have given them, Heather and Kirk are raising their daughter Kieli on salmon every day in every way. And in the long twilight of summer, near the Taku River, 
they ride by skiff to the place where the salmon and their family have always gathered. So for thousands of years, people have always gathered where there are salmon. In Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska, the annual return of the world's largest front of sockeye salmon triggered a great migration of native people who came for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Today, the migration of both salmon and people continues in Bristol Bay, home for the past century to a thriving commercial fishery. People come for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Melanie Brown, who we heard from earlier, uh, she's on the left in red. Uh, she's migrated with her family to Bristol Bay in the summers her entire life. Melanie's ancestors are Yupik, Aleut, and Anupiak. She inherited her great grandfather's commercial fishing, fishing site uh, near the Naknak River. This is one of nine rivers that feeds Bristol Bay. So there are two ways to commercial fish in Bristol Bay, set netting and drift netting. Melanie is a set netter. So set netters fish close to shore from a fixed location and many use skiffs. Drift netters use bigger boats and they can fish anywhere within the legal boundaries. Now some set netters, they don't use boats at all and they fish from the beach. And as one beach set netter told me, most of the time it's hard, miserable work in the cold, in the rain, in the mud with little sleep for days on end. So the Bristol Bay fishery is intense. Why? Well, an enormous volume of salmon pulses into the bay in a short period of time. Since the 1960s, an average of 33 million fish return every year. This year, 63 million fish return. Now, most salmon runs in Alaska happen over the course of four to six weeks, but here, 80 to 90% of that run comes in just 20 days. With salmon showing up in mass and limited hours to catch them, it's all hands on deck. So for Melanie in the middle, Commercial fishing in Bristol Bay, it's a business, but it's rooted in family. Her dad captained his own drift boat, her sister's family fishes their set net site, and Melanie and her mother, who's on the left, and her, her mom's in her 70s, they fish their two set net sites together. And Melanie's daughter, Mari, on the right, she started fishing at age 14. And Melanie tells me, I feel like I'm living a legacy, a continuation of a river flowing in time. The Knack Knack is my family's home stream, and I'm grateful that it has given us life for so long. I want that to continue for my children. I spent a day on Melanie's skiff watching just how physically demanding set netting can be. Set, pull, pick the net, repeat for six to eight hours, rest in between fishing openings, and do it all again the next tide and the next until the season ends. At the end of the day, Melanie invites me to the family home for a dinner of moose spaghetti and birthday cake for her son, Oliver. I ask everyone, what does salmon mean to you? The answers come rapid fire. Food, home, family, opportunity, education, blessing, work ethic. Melanie tells me that when she was young, she started asking fundamental questions like, what's the meaning of life? And she says, there are certain events that mark our lives. And at the end, that's it. But there's the hope that we're passing something on too. You look at salmon and how much they pass on, not only to their offspring, but to the whole system that they're a part of and benefit. I think a human who has lived life well does that too. So we've seen how salmon benefit people who catch and sell them for their livelihood and people who rely on them for a substantial part of their diet and culture. They also benefit people who make a living as sport fishing guides. John Yeager on the right, he lives in Wrangell near the mouth of the transboundary Stikine River in Southeast. And he takes people on his boat to fish for salmon in the ocean. And he tells me, I'm not so much trying to fill the freezers of my clients. I'm trying to fill their minds with memories. There are many firsts on my boat. First time in Alaska, first time catching a salmon, or first time fishing with a grandchild. John grew up in a small town in Ohio and his family owned a grocery store. He tells me that when he was young, if he wanted ice cream or T-bone steaks, he'd just go to the family store and grab what he needed. He never really understood where food came from and what it took to get it. When he came to Alaska, though, he married into a family that homesteaded on the Stikine River and fishes and hunts as a way of life. And he says, living the way we do in Alaska, I think a lot about food, especially salmon. When my family catches the salmon, we give some to my wife's parents and to an elderly neighbor, and then we share the rest together. It's not just the sustenance of the fish. It's the spirit of the fish. Everywhere I went, people told me that salmon are a gift to the land, water, animals, plants, and people. And when you're on the receiving end of a gift, 
you give thanks and you give back. It's the salmon way. Throughout my travels, whether I met with people for 10 minutes or 10 days, I always seem to leave with salmon in my hands. I was so touched by the generosity that the salmon people showed me. I learned that sharing is the Alaska way, and then it goes beyond food and includes sharing firewood, laughter, sweat, and tears. This generosity of spirit forges relationships and relationships create communities. Now, I wish that I could live the salmon way of life where I live in Washington state. Now, when I look at this map, I feel both pain and hope. Let's talk about the pain first. The once staggering runs of salmon in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Southern British Columbia are now less than 10% of their historical abundance. How did this happen? Well, this is the Columbia River along the border of Washington and Oregon. It was once one of the greatest salmon producing systems on earth. We lost most of the salmon in the Columbia due to habitat destruction, overharvest, hydroelectric dams, and substituting hatcheries for habitat. When the gift of salmon is destroyed or degraded, the salmon ways of life are too. This sad story has repeated itself most everywhere in the world where there were salmon on both sides of the Pacific and Atlantic oceans. Now, let's talk about hope. Alaska is the salmon state, one of the few places left in the world where salmon can still thrive, where salmon people live connected to the fish with an appreciation for what nourishes both body and spirit, a full smokehouse, a connection to a home stream and community, gathering with family and friends, sharing the seasonal bounty and passing all of this to the next generations. Throughout my travels, I asked everyone I met what salmon mean to them. And it didn't matter if the people I asked the question to fish for their food, livelihood or fun, everyone gave me the same answers, family, community, culture, well-being and way of life. And while I set out to tell stories in my book that celebrate the salmon way, there's also a cautionary tale to tell. Bristol Bay, home to the world's largest run of sockeye salmon, is threatened by the proposed pebble mine. The transboundary rivers in southeast are threatened by pollution from Canadian mining operations. In some parts of the state, there are salmon runs that are in decline, including those of the Kuskokwim and Yukon rivers. And there is always pressure to destroy more salmon habitat, including building new roads in southeast Tongass National Forest. And how will a change in climate affect salmon? So there's a strong belief among Alaska natives that if they respect the salmon, the fish will come back every year and give themselves to the people. If we want these salmon relationships to continue, we have to respect salmon and give them what they need, clean, healthy, fresh water to spawn and rear and a thriving ocean to mature. So today it's worth celebrating and defending that Alaska is still a place where salmon are the lifeblood, where we have an incredible opportunity to leave a salmon filled legacy, where the salmon way is still a way of life. And so I dedicate this talk to the salmon people. May your lives always pulse with the beauty and mystery of your home streams. And to the salmon, may you always come home. And to all of you, I leave you with the greatest lesson that salmon have taught me. Life short, be a life force with the time you're given and give it everything you've got. Well, thank you. I'm going to uh, introduce my favorite fishy artist friend, uh, Ray Troll uh, from Ketchikan. Uh, Ray, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we'd love to hear what your connection to salmon is, what your salmon way of life. Then Ray, Ray, we can't hear you. <laughs> we need, we need. There we are. There you go. Yeah, I'm a boomer. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Amy, that was really cool. Really very inspirational as always. And uh, it's a pleasure to have known you all these years. I'm speaking to you from Ketchikan, the current and the, the current and ancestral lands of the Tongass Clinket. And I have been inspired by salmon for low these many, many years. And I'm going to show some slides right now. And there we go. And I will do this. I think I'm sharing my screen. So yeah, I moved to Ketchikan, Alaska in uh, 1983, the big rainy city up here in the north. Uh, 
13,000 people on the island of Gado, and I came here not really knowing what salmon were all about. I moved to this rainy town, and I soon found myself immersed in the fishing culture, the fish culture. I came up here to be a fishmonger. My sister Kate Troll brought me up to help her run a seafood store, and little did I realize that this fish culture was so inspiring, and before I knew it, I was drawing and painting the fish, but I needed to learn my fish, so I had, I didn't, when I first came here, did not know a humpy from a hole in the ground, but uh, <laughs> luckily there are a bunch of, uh, there are some uh, monomics and there's some nice uh, uh, symbols, you know, this hand symbol is one of my favorites, chump for thumb, poke you in the eye, sock guy, the big finger for king, your ring finger for silver, and then a pinky for your pink salmon. And uh, I just think that's so cool. And what's also interesting too, is that each of these names, uh, there's a second name, there's 10 names, there's five major salmon species, and they each have two names. Well, one of the other things that I realized too, as I learned, I, I tumbled deeper and deeper into the topic of fish and the world of fish and began hanging out with biologists and paleontologists, is realizing that these ocean going fish you know, are connected to the landscape in such a big way. They rely upon the landscape and they're ocean going fish. It's just this beautiful concept. And I think that is just truly mind blowing. They're born in the streams and rivers of the Tongass uh, where I live and also up and down the, uh, the Northwest coast and up into Alaska. And I began to draw the, the, the forest and try to depict these things. This is a t-shirt called, uh, preserve the balance. But this is an image, I, I strive to get my images to, you know, just at a glance, you can see the concept. And this concept is, you know, salmon are the landscape, salmon scape. And they carry within them the nutrients from the ocean and the nutrients from the forest back and forth they go. And, and this is a, a relationship that has been going on for millions of years. They date back in time at least 50 million years, almost to the days of the dinosaurs. They have been thriving in uh, the Northwest Coast, the North Coast here in the Pacific. The genus Oncorhynchus has been a long lasting genus. And this idea that the, that the uh, fish basically swim into the forest, and this is a painting I did uh, for the University of Alaska Southeast in Juneau. And here is that concept too, literally the, the fish swim into the, uh, into, the, into the streams, into the forest and the isotopes from the fish themselves are found within the trees. So it's that idea that uh, it's a back and forth type of thing. So as I said, five salmon, 10 names, you know, dog salmon or chums, pinks or humpies, reds or sock guys, cohos or silvers, kings or chinooks. Getting across that and trying to have fun with uh, the different concepts, the different names, and also realizing this, you know, this, uh, this group of fish go way back in time. There's actually, once upon a time, there was a gigantic salmon that uh, grew to be about eight feet long. It had saber-like teeth, but now we know they're like spike-like teeth. So this is the giant spike tooth salmon. That's how big some of the vertebrae are. Like I said, I've tumbled into the world of these fish for a long, long time. This is an image I did for the Smithsonian uh, Ocean Hall. I was very privileged to have my art in there. This shows the life cycle of the salmon and all the species that rely upon them for a living. And that is the concept that I wanna leave you with, uh, that these fish have been thriving here for millions and millions of years. If we know how to interact with them, they will feed us forever. And uh, if we know how to, like I said, respect them. And so my three words, well, this is four words here. This is a t-shirt says, long may you run. This is a t-shirt that we're gonna give away, but these are in a minute, but these are my three words, forest fish forever. And with that, I will stop sharing. And thank you for having me on. Great, thank you so much, Ray and Amy both. And you know, I think it's just so powerful to see how through your art forms, you know, whether that's photography, painting, music, you know, just your ability to, to really capture the magic of salmon and, and to share it with all of us and, and many others. So thank you.
Um, I just want to be mindful of time. I know we're trying to keep this to about a half hour because we know it's the middle of everyone's busy day. Um, but just some kind of final words and, and things that we'll leave you with, as well as our raffle prize winners. Um, if you haven't typed in your three salmon words yet in the chat, or if you're watching this on Facebook, you know, feel free to put it in the comments section. Please do so. We're going to compile all those words and do some fun things that we'll share with you all over the coming days and weeks. Um, and as Amy alluded to or spoke directly to, you know, we're, we're really fortunate in Alaska to still have healthy wild salmon runs. However, our salmon in Alaska are not immune to the impacts of habitat loss and degradation or you know, the even bigger threat of climate change. And we're already seeing some of those impacts now with lower run sizes, smaller fish sizes. Um, so as you know, people who care about wild salmon and maybe depend on wild salmon, you know, it's important that we're all upholding our end of the relationship that we have with wild salmon and look out for the salmon that provide us with so much. So that's why Salmon State today, we're launching a new Salmon Steward Pledge um, and we're gonna be putting that link in the chat. It's also on Salmon State's website where we'll, we'll live indefinitely. But we encourage you to sign this pledge um, as a way to join a community of others who care about Alaska's wild salmon and are committed to making sure that Alaska remains a salmon state for future generations. So over um, the coming months, we'll send you specific ways that you can help advocate for Alaska's wild salmon and places. So please sign that pledge and share it with others. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Amy and Ray, who are going to close our program here with a quick, quick raffle to some lucky winners. All right, great. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, Ray, you and me, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to raffle off four fantastic salmon inspired prizes. Um, so the first, uh, oh, first of all, Ray, if you could please give me four numbers between the numbers of one and 350. Can you hear me? Uh, am I on? You're on. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure the boomer and the zoomer, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you would like four numbers. I have uh, randomly chosen four numbers between one and 350. The first one is 140, 140. Second number is 73. The third number is 60. And the final number is 293. All right. It's really cool. We had 350 people here today. That's really that's yes, wonderful. I know. Wow. Well, Celebrating Salmon. <laughs> and uh, so they get this t shirt, right? Is that the deal? Yes. First prize, the first raffle prize is Ray Troll's Long May You Run t shirt. And so our winner for that is. Daniel Tandy and Ray will be in touch with you via email about your size and Ray's going to sign the t-shirt for you yep. as well. Yep, my so, pleasure. Yeah. Congrats, Daniel. <laughs> All right. Our second raffle prize is a copy of my book, um, The Salmon Way. Um, and that goes to Marion Komar. I hope I'm saying that right. And Marion, I'll be in touch with you about uh, uh, your address and getting it to you. Our third prize, um, a Salmon Sisters cookbook and tote bag that I think Elizabeth has in her possession. Um, this is a great prize. Um, and that one goes to uh, Marie Gallagher. So congrats, Marie. I will be in touch with you. And finally, our final prize. We don't have it in our hands uh, because it's food, uh, delicious uh, Alaska wild salmon. Um, it's a whole box full of uh, yummy goodies, uh, um, graciously donated by uh, Eva's Wild. And that goes to Kimberly Piat. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, again, we'll, we will be in touch with you and, and all the prize winners. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to play one more song for you um, on, our, on our way out here. Uh, it's a beautiful song, has not been released yet. So you are all uh, among the first to hear it. Um, the song is called Save What You Love. Um, it's written by Ray Troll and performed by his daughter, uh, not his daughter, uh -huh. sorry, by his son, Patrick, and Patrick's band, Whiskey Class. Um, yeah, that's so right. Enjoy. I wrote the uh, lyrics. They did the, they did the music. It's wonderful music, but thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks yeah. everyone for joining us. Yeah. <laughs>
Like that. 